so um, welcome to the med cult here and our topic for today would be the scalp now the term scalp is applied to soft tissues covering the vault of the skull um, over here I have a picture you can see so as it is saying it is covering the vault of our skull so all this uh, area where you can see a thick underlying hair tissue uh, this is the entire uh, this structure is called the scalp which is uh, always covered by thick hair so right now I'm just outlining the boundary of the scalp yeah you can get a pretty rough idea of what the scalp uh, mostly looks like so this entire thing is called the scalp and this is covering the cranium the cranial bones the brain everything and on top of this is the place where the hair uh, hair from our cranium grows this entire area is the scalp so I'm gonna change the colors back to normal and you can appreciate the scalp as it was before and I'm just going to just going to keep the outline here this is the scalp now first what we need to understand is the extent of the scalp so let's say the extent of the scalp now it extends anteriorly up to the eyebrows so anteriorly up to the eyebrows also known as uh, the superciliary arches super ciliary arches oh, sorry there and posteriorly up to the superior nuchal lines and laterally on each side up to the superior temporal lines and according to some authorities does uh, they also uh, mention that the scalp extends laterally on each side up to the zygomatic arc but for our discussion here we're just going to keep it to the things that I've written so the three main points that we have to understand in understanding scalp is anteriorly up to the eyebrows or the superciliary arches, posteriorly up to the superior nuchal lines and laterally on each side up to the superior temporal lines. Um, now I have a model a picture here where we can understand the extent. So at number one we have the superciliary arches. Yeah, this is number one. So let's see where the superciliary arches are. So this is a picture of the skull of the human body. And number one, we have the superciliary arches. So this is the orbit, as you can see, and this is the supraorbital margin, and this is the supraorbital notch. So right in this place, here on both sides, we have the superciliary arches. So this here is the superciliary arch superciliary arch oh. yeah and then at number two posteriorly up to the superior nuchal lines so posteriorly and this is the second point so at front we have the superciliary arches and posteriorly up to the superior nuchal lines now the superior nuchal lines are lines which are present in the occipital bone present at the back side uh, I don't have a picture of the occipital bone on the from the back view but here you can understand this this portion is the occipital bone let me just highlight it with red this over here 
is the occipital bone and over here somewhere we have the superior nuchal lines sorry so this is the superior nuchal line and let me just indicate that with an arrow this is the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone and laterally on each side and laterally on each side up to the superior temporal lines so this is number three laterally on each side to superior temporal lines so this is the temporal bone this entire thing is the temporal bone and it's uh, in the temporal bone we have two lines known as the inferior temporal line and the superior temporal line so uh, and in this part it's saying the superior temporal line so the superior temporal line would be here somewhere so and yeah to sum it up here we had the supraorbital superciliary uh, ciliary arches and now to sum it up we can say the extent of scalp this entire thing is the total e extension of the scalp to the superior temporal line in the front to the superciliary arches all the way back to the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone and uh, sorry not here not here sorry about that yeah let me just uh, I'll just change the color and also the marker yes so this is the superior temporal line and this is the superior nuchal line we go all the way we're just drawing the boundary here and then the super, uh, superciliary arches and over here we have the scalp this entire thing is called the scalp so we are now done kind of with the extension of the scalp there's really nothing uh, anything more to this uh, the next thing that we're going to do is the layers of the scalp In the layers of the scalp, at number one, we have the skin. Number two, we have connective tissue, also called as the super feet. Sorry for that. So known as the superficial fascia. Number three, we have the aponeurosis. Aponeurosis, also known as the epicranial aponeurosis or the occipital frontalis muscle. Uh, this is number three, uh, layer number three. At layer number four, we have loose areolar tissue. And at number five, we have the pericranium. Pericranium. Yes. So these are the layers of the scalp. Now there's a kind of a mnemonic to remember this now if you see the spelling of the word scalp s c a l p you can also see s c a l p so s for skin c for connective tissue or the superficial fascia you can just remember connective tissue uh, a for epicranial aponeurosis yeah you have to remember this one epicranial aponeurosis four for loose areolar tissue and five for the pedic pedicranium now the skin of the scalp is thick and hairy now the skin of the scalp we see here is thick and hairy except for over the forehead region 
for the uh, forehead region yeah it is firmly adherent to the epicardial aponeurosis the, that is the that is the third layer the skin is attached deeply to the epicranial aponeurosis and its dense connective tissue of superficial fascia as in palms and soles but being hairy it contains maximum number of hair follicles and associated with sebaceous glands and what happens is as a result scalp that is this portion scalp this portion is the most commonest site of sebaceous cysts and it also contains numerous sweat glands so i'll re uh, repeat myself here as it is hairy as there are a lot of hairs in this scalp what happens is it contains a number of hair follicles and which are associated with sebaceous glands so these are our sebaceous glands as a result the scalp is the commonest site as a result this is the commonest site of uh, sebaceous cysts it also contains numerous sweat glands so these are our sebaceous glands then we can also say that there are numerous sweat glands present here and there and so these are our sebaceous uh, sweat glands and now moving on it has been estimated that there are about uh, uh, 1 lakh 20 thousand hair on the scalp of an adult and these are just the extra did you know kind of stuff and I'm not really going to go in much deeper uh, and yeah I'll just remove all this stuff that I drew just here okay now for yeah I, I already have given you guys an, a rough idea of skin what I said and now moving on to the second layer the connective tissue connective tissue or the superficial fascia okay uh, one thing I can do is I can uh, I can draw and explain it's better to draw and explain so I'll just draw over here so number one we have the we have the skin let's say this is the skin S K I N. This is the skin. And number two, we have the connective tissue. This is the dense connective tissue. Like this area is very dense. So this is the dense connective tissue. connective tissue ah. so the superficial fascia of the scalp is made up of the dense fibrous connective tissue that is this layer that is this layer right here that uh, firmly binds the skin to the un uh, underlying epicranial aponeurosis so as this it is an aponeurosis let's say this is our epicranial aponeurosis and I'm going to draw this a little bit deeper so this is our epicranial aponeurosis and yeah I'll just put in some designs to make it look cool And this is our epicranial aponeurosis so we have three layers already here one is the skin I should have drawn uh, written the skin the red anyway so we have the skin then we have the connective tissue and then we have the epicranial aponeurosis Just for this one. yeah we have the epicranial aponeurosis so uh, we were in the second layer so the superficial fascia of the scalp is made up of the dense fibrous connective tissue that firmly binds the skin that is this layer to the underlying uh, uh, underlying muscle occipital frontalis muscle if you can remember from what I had said but it is also known as the epicranial aponeurosis and fibrous septa divide this layer into numerous small pockets containing lobules of fat this is not really important the blood vessels and nerves of the scalp lie in this layer so most of the blood vessels of the scalp 
lie in in this region blood vessels and also the nerves of the scalp yeah nerves of the scalp lie in this region they enter from below at the periphery at the walls of the vessels the walls of the vessels as you can see these this is the walls of the vessels now these are firmly adherent to the fibrous network hence when blood vessels are torn or cut here what happens is uh, torn or cut during an injury they are unable to retract and cause profuse bleeding the bleeding however can be stopped by press, pressing against the underlying bone whatever may be underlying the bone uh, so we're done with the aponeurosis part and now let's move on to the fourth layer that is the loose areolar connective tissue I'll draw this here loose areolar connective tissue this is our loose areolar connective tissue and this is a important uh, clinical question because uh, I'll come to it later so loose areolar connective tissue uh, before coming to the loose areolar connective tissue I, I just drew the, uh, drew the loose areolar connective tissue so that I can explain to you guys the epicranial aponeurosis much better so so going back to the epicranial aponeurosis this is formed mainly by the occipital frontalis muscle as I said earlier now the occipital frontalis muscle uh, let's say this is our cranium and the occipital frontalis muscle consists of small, uh, four small bellies uh, so we are looking at this from behind so let's say um, this is the skull this is our neck uh, we're looking at the person from behind and a little bit upwards so it's like uh, we're looking at him from behind and we're viewing, uh, viewing him from a helicopter so what we're gonna see is this would be his ears and the uh, his eyes are here and just to give you guys an idea and his neck would be somewhat like this and this is a 2d drawing on a and I'm explaining to you guys a 3d structure so it's going to be a bit of a problem now here I'm just going to uh, erase the eyes and continuing the occipital frontalis muscle has four bellies so this is the occipital frontalis muscle which is the epicranial aponeurosis and it has uh, four smaller bellies two frontal bellies that is uh, this one two frontal bellies these are the frontal bellies and two occipital bellies these are our occipital bellies because this and we are naming it because over here we have the occipital bone and this is the frontal bone so it has two bellies uh, four bellies two from the frontal and four four from the occipital since a greater part of this layer is formed by the aponeurosis it is also called the aponeurotic layer the aponeurosis of occipital frontalis is also called as the uh, the gallia aponeurotica and now the main important part of this uh, fourth uh, the third layer no uh, yeah the third layer is the wounds of the scalp do not gape unless epicranial aponeurosis is cut transversely so you have to uh, give a deep incision transversely you have to cut it like this way if there is any kind of wound due to any trauma or hemorrhage in this re uh, region the uh, the 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 direction of tone of the occipital frontalis muscle what it does is you have to cut the muscle otherwise the the pus is not going to drain onto the onto the uh, dural venous sinuses and that's going to cause a lot of problem and now coming on to the loose areolar tissue that is our fourth layer the loose loose areolar tissue this one this one 
Uh, as its name suggests, this layer is uh, made up of loose areola tissue. It serves as a natural plane of uh, cleavage during craniotomy. This layer is traversed by emissary veins, connecting ve uh, uh, emissary veins, connecting veins in the second layer of scalp with intracranial dural venous sinuses. So let's say um, this is the loose areolar connective tissue, and beneath this we have the dural venous sinuses. We all know what dural venous sinuses is, right? So let's say this is the superior sagittal sinus now as this is the superior sagittal sinus and let's say this one here is the fox cerebri enveloping the superior sagittal sinus so uh, as i said this layer is traversed by emissary veins so emissary veins emissary veins uh, the, yeah, the emissary veins connecting veins in the second layer of scalp that is the second layer of scalp that is the connective tissue this part second layer of scalp within uh, with the intracranial dural venous sinuses so it goes like this and these would be are emissary veins from the connective tissue so these are our emissary veins traversing the loose areolar connective tissue connecting the second layer of scalp that is the connective tissue with the dural venous sinuses and uh, that with that we complete our fourth layer that is the loose areolar connective tissue and now onto the fifth and final layer the pericranium the pericranium yeah the fifth layer of scalp is formed by the periosteum of bones of vault of the skull called pericranium so if you're looking at uh, let's say this is a coronal section now a coronal section is a cut from yeah this this thing that you're seeing here this is called the coronal suture so what we're doing is we're driving a blade like a hammer or anything across and now nah, uh, along along this coronal uh, coro coronal suture and if we do that we are seeing now this is the head we are seeing this is the head and here we have the brain and everything so this is a coronal section of the head so here we have our cranial bones most probably we'll, uh, here we'll have the parietal bones the frontal bones so this is our thick cranial bones cranium forming the cranium um, yeah the, this is the fifth layer of scalp formed by periosteum of bones or vault of the skull called pericranium it is uh, loosely attached to the bones and can be easily stripped it and it can be easily stripped so this let's say this is our cranial bones and this pericranium what this thing is it is a it is a, a loose con uh, connective tissue attached to the pericranium so let's say this is the pericranium i'll label it this is the peri cranium and as I had said earlier this is a cranium and so the fifth layer is called the cra uh, pericranium as it is surrounding the cranium so pericranium huh. it is firmly attached to the bones and can be easily stripped but at uh, sutures it is firmly attached to sutural membrane which in turn uh, attaches it to the endocranium not needed uh, okay so more or less we are done with the layers of the scalp now one important thing that I left is
is now let's go back to the occipital frontalis muscle now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw I'm going to draw the occipital uh, frontalis muscle again so let's say this is our cranium okay let me draw it a bit better let's say like ahead and we are looking at it uh, this from the top view and this is our occipital frontalis muscle as I said earlier it has two bellies the frontal bellies and the occipital bellies so these are the frontal bellies and these are the occipital bellies now the frontal bellies they arise from the skin and subcutaneous tissue over the eyebrows and the root of the nose so they arise from the subcutaneous tissue over the eyebrows so these are the eyebrows over the eyebrows and root of the nose so this is the root of the nose so they arise from here the frontal bellies and run backward and run backward backward and inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis in front of the coronal suture so this is the coronal suture so they have no bony attachment of their own the deeper fibers of the frontal belly merge with procerus corrugator superciliae yeah, and orbicularis oculi muscles uh, muscles you don't need to remember the frontal bellies are longer wider and partly united with each other along their median border so i have to do one correction here as we can see the frontal bellies are longer so we have to make them long they are longer wider and partly united in the middle along their median borders the occipital bellies from the lateral two-third uh, arise from the lateral two-third of the superior nuchal lines so as i said this is the superior nuchal line so if this is the entire superior nuchal lines this is the lateral two-third and this part is this part the lateral two-third and for clarity, clarity's sake let's say this entire thing is the superior nuchal line on both sides and the occipital frontalis muscle arises from the lateral two-third of the superior nuchal lines and extend forwards to be inserted in the, into the epicranial aponeurosis so let's say this entire thing is an imaginary epicranial aponeurosis and everything is getting inserted into this epicranial aponeurosis the two occipital bellies are small and separated from each other by a considerable gap unlike the frontal bellies which are united in the middle by a considerable gap this gap is filled by again the epicranial aponeurosis Now, one important, uh, um, yeah, so with this, we complete the only the introduction of the scalp. In the next video, we're going to continue with the uh, clinical correlation of the scalp, the nerve supply, and the arterial supply. So, guys, if you like my video, then please hit the like button and subscribe as. I'm going to drop more videos on anatomy, the entire anatomy, physiology, biology, everything. This is just a small video, the starting video of scalp. So yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys in my next video. Peace.